worship, Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Asking that as we go forward with this word of God, that you have already watered it. And now it's time to plant it again. It's time for your people, Lord, to hear what you have for them this morning, God. We ask that you cover each and every one of us, oh God. We ask that you open our ears, Lord. That we are able to hear what you are saying. We thank you, Father God, that you are mighty in our lives. We thank you that you are gracious, that you are merciful. Oh God, and you desire to get us back to where we need to be. So we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that we did get off track. Because in getting off track, oh God, we are able to see the more of who you are. So we thank you, Father God. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. And it is in Jesus' mighty and master's name that we pray. In all the saints' name. Yes, Lord, you may be seated. I played around with this message for a little bit every week that I got pushed to the side. But again, God does what he needs to do. And he will keep you where he needs to be, or keep you where you need to be, so that he can be in your life. Amen? So, I just want to hit a couple of things this morning. I'll try not to be as the prophet and the apostle says before you're home, but I won't make any promises this morning. Um, the title of our message this morning which I also play with a little bit, but it's identity restored. Ooh. How to reclaim your lost or stolen identity. How many of us know that the world can have its way with us and we get lost in the world, therefore losing who we are? So I'm going to go through five topics this morning. This is truly going to be a teachable moment. And I'm going to go through it as if I'm teaching, not as a standard word. So we're going to cover warning signs of an identity theft. We're going to cover identity, what your identity is defined as, whether that be by the world standards or the spiritual nature. We're going to cover your identity as your birthright. Discovering who you are and reclaiming your identity. Amen. So let's start with really defining identity. And I always go through a process whenever I'm doing a message. The Lord always uses me so that I, in return, I can give it back to you. Amen. So your identity is who you are. It's the way you think about yourself. It's the way you are viewed by others. And the characteristics that define you and make you unique. It's who you are, the way you think about yourself, the way you are viewed by others, and the characteristics that define you and make you unique. We'll start with your character. We always shoot for having the character of Christ. But what does that really mean? Christ was different. He was different than anyone that he encountered. Why was he different? Because he was the Lord incarnated. Amen? Amen. So your character is what makes you distinctive in comparison to another. So your character is your character, not somebody else's. And that somebody else is not your character. It's what describes you. It is the unique qualities and abilities that the Lord has given only you. It is how you present yourself. How do you want other people to see you? Your character is put together with your personality. It is your behavior, how you act, 
emotionally, environmentally in front of other people. It's those emotional patterns that you create. It is your interaction with others. For example, some of us can be so serious. I can be a serious person sometimes to a fault because my husband is a comedian. I told him he missed his call. <laughs> but I can be serious sometimes to a fault. He always tells me that scripture that he said earlier. Laughter is good for the bones. And it is. It really is. It even gets things pumping inside your body. When you laugh, your heart is joyful. Yes. When you laugh, your veins, your blood vessels, it's all joyful. But when you're all serious, everything about you is uptight. So laugh a little bit. Um, it's how you think, how you feel, and how you behave. It is the specific traits about you. It is your individuality. Your qualities and your character that distinguish you from that next person. So for example, we've got two sets of twins in the house, y'all. We've got Astria and Tassie. We've got Daron and Dion, Apostle and Prophet. They, are, they were born the same day. They were born of the same at this of the same person. They came out, basically, they came out at the same time. Nope, that's wrong. One came out before the other. Um, but what I'm alluding to is that even though they have that same birthday, they share maybe a couple minutes apart that they were born, but they share all of those things. They are totally different individuals. Cassie is who she is. Astra is who she is. Apostle is who he is. Prophet is who he is. Their characters are different. Their personalities are different. Their individuality is what God established in them. If he wanted twins, for example, to be the same of the same everything, he would be a prophet, he would be a prophet. Or he would be an apostle, he would be an apostle. But God called them to different giftings because he made them differently. Yes. Amen? Amen? When I start researching identity and just really honing in on what it means, I'm like, Lord, give me something better than just a definition. What he gave me is that your identity is an exact likeness which suggests that we get our identity from something or someone that already exists. The Lord already existed before he created us. So our exact likeness does not come from the person that we sit next to. It comes from the Lord. Amen? Amen. So if we never truly know the Lord or know Christ... How do we discover that opportunity to redefine our identity? We got to get to know the Lord. Yes. Right. Because if you don't know him, you don't know you. Come on. That's it right there. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, 17 of the New Living Translation says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. How different, how differently sh we should know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Mm -hmm. The old is gone. A new life has begun. If you have lost your identity, which most of us have, it can be redefined and restored. I'm going to go through a few warning signs that your identity has either been stolen, given away, or taken away. How do you know your identity has been stolen? You know your God-given purpose, yet you don't, yet you do not know who you are in it. You know what God calls you to do, 
but you don't know who you are or what you're supposed to do. You know who you are in him. You know the purpose that he's called you to because we've given it to so many of you. But yet you don't know who you are in that purpose. Prophet Lorente would pick on him all the time. He knows his God-given purpose. And he is so on track to becoming who he is supposed to be in that. I love to see, especially my young ones, grow and grow and grow in the Lord. <clears throat> he has called so many of you, and they teach it all the time. When we get into a new building, we don't need to be going there trying to learn who we are, trying to figure out who we are, right. trying to know what it is that God wants us to do. We need to go there ready, willing, and able to follow it out, right? Amen. Here's another warning sign. You are all wrapped up in your title or somebody else's title, whether it be on the job or even in ministry. I can't want to be a prophet because Prophet Dion is a prophet. I can't want to be an apostle because Apostle Duran is an apostle. I'll give this other example. When I first heard the Passion Translation, it wasn't because I was scrolling through my translations in my Bible app. It was because Patricia mentioned it, right? So I went, I read a couple of scriptures because I'm like, okay, Lord, I can't just read it just because Patricia reads it. I need to know Really, what's it about? And then I realized, okay, all the books aren't there. Like, what's happening? So as I went through it and I start researching, who wrote this? Why did he write this? Well, yeah, a few books are, the books, he only included Psalms. I think Song of Psalms, Proverbs, and the New Testament. The reason is because he wanted to hone in on the passion of God. That's why it's called the Passion Translation. Right. So I'm like, wow, Lord, that makes sense why it's written the way it's written. Because he wants to point out the passions of God. God has a passion for you being passionate about him. Needless to say, it is an awesome translation. Um, I rarely use my New Living Translation like I used to. I pretty much go to that. But again, if you are confused about a translation to read, it's a good one to read. But if you want every book of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, you got to find another one. <clears throat> you allow yourself to be defined by the actions you take that make you credible by the world's standards. Ooh. Your whole existence is defined by the relationships that you have chosen for yourself or those that you're trying to steal from someone else. Mm. That's good. And I'll get into more of that later. Your life is reckless and you are on an emotional roller coaster full of ups and downs, bumps and bruises, mm -hmm. and your trust is in people rather than God. Wow. That's a really good indication that your identity is stolen. Because you don't know who you are, again, right. and you want what you think everybody else has. Yes. Instead of discovering mm -hmm. what God has mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Your ways are unstable. And your thoughts are one-sided, and you wander from place to place to place. Whether that be from church to church to church, from job to job to job, from relationship to relationship to relationship. If you are omitting God in any of that, you're never going to find what you're looking for. Because you can't place these things above him. Right. Because he's the one that gives you the desires, 
Nope. Your heart's desire. But you got to have the heart to go and find him. Amen. Amen. You thrive on people needing you rather than directing them to God. Come on. That's good. That's that you thrive on people needing you rather than directing them to God. What does that Jesus. look like? Yes, Lord. You try to make yourself God in someone else's life. That's good. Instead of telling them, oh, girl, what is that situation? Let me pray with you. Let me pray for you. Let me help you get through this. Come to church. Get delivered. There's some healing waiting for you. Not to scare them off, but there's a whole world of spiritual things that God wants to get to that person. Yes. But then when you step in and you be like, girl, I know what you need. Uh-uh. -uh. You should leave him right now. No, you should quit that job. You shouldn't be friends with her. No. You've got to lead them to God. God has got to give them exactly what he gave you. Right. Start off with giving them your testimony. Girl, I was in the same place. I know exactly what you think. I know exactly how you feel. But let me tell you what God did for me. Yes. That's leading them to God. That's right. You don't have to grab their hand and pull them through that door. Right. You give them your testimony. You tell them what God did for you. Mm -hmm. And either they're going to walk through that door on their own, or they're going to stay where they're at. Amen. Amen. You're doing what God has gifted you to do. But you count it as entertainment, and there's no trace of God in carrying it out. It's got to be a trace of God. Your gift is nothing without him. I don't care how good you dance. I don't care how good you right. sing. If there is no trace of God in the gift that he has given you, right. it means nothing. When you think that you are above those around you and too good to come down from your high horse to help them. I've seen that so much in my life where people think, oh my God, they're just beneath me. I'm not going to help. Mm -hmm. Why? Right. Guess what? You were there once. Yep. You were there. Yep. God sends people across our path. To see how we're gonna how we're gonna respond. That's good. He might even show up himself sometimes. He might appear right in front of you. You turn around and that person is gone. Mm. And you have no idea that it was even him. Yes. I can remember being in a store, grocery store, um, me and Divinity. And we're walking through the store and I see something behind us but I never turned around so we just keep going and I hear a man and a woman talking but again I just kept going five minutes later this guy comes in front of us and he's like do you mind if I give her a word talking to divinity I was like well, okay <laughs> so he began to tell her things that we had already been telling her I was like oh wow you know, thank you, Lord. So I stood there and I listened. Um, he started telling her about the TV and just different different things that she had going on. So, like I said, I heard it be a man and a woman behind me, but only the guy came. And I never saw the woman go past me. So he gave her whatever it was he gave her. I saw the aisle that he went down, y'all. I kid you not. I saw the aisle that he went down. As soon as he walked away, he turned down an aisle. We got to that aisle. There was no man. There was no woman. Wow. That really started my, and this was years ago, but that started helping me believe, like, Lord, you're going to show up wherever you want to show up mm -hmm. to do what it is that you need to do. Thank you. Galatians 6, 1 through 3 of the Passion Translation says, My beloved friends, if you see a believer who is overtaken with fault, the one who is in spirit should 
the one who is in the spirit should seek to restore him in the spirit of gentleness. But keep watch over your own heart so that you won't be tempted to exalt yourself over him. Mm -hmm. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one. In Patricia's last message, she talks about the anointed one and the anointing. Yes. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's troubles. If you think you are somebody too important to stoop down to help another, when you really are not, you are living in deception. Yes. So it's a lie. You're making yourself believe that it's something that you don't have to do, but you're deceiving yourself when you believe that. <clears throat> this one, I tried to save for last, um, but God wanted me to kind of hone in on this one, and, and even me and my husband had to talk about it this week, but we talk a lot about when a father is out of the home, right? And just how important it is for him to be there. And yes, some odds occur um, when that happens. But when it does, when there is no father, which the father is like that grounding, he should be the one that gives us that foundation. But when he's not there, you have no idea where you are or how to be grounded on a firm foundation. As boys, you have no idea how to become a man. You lose sight of that. The streets get you or some other men or a man in attempt to take on the role as a father in your life. But you're still lost being wounded and conflicted. Because it makes you wonder, why did my dad want me? Why didn't my dad want to be around me? Why did my dad leave? Especially when he's still living. Yes. Children find a piece of their identity in their natural father. Yes. True. But when he leaves, he takes that with him. I always, call the, I always tell divinity, and this is not to pick on divinity, so when she watches this, she won't think I'm picking on her, but... <clears throat> I always tell her, you are your dad's little minion. Oh my gosh, girl, he back in, you back in. You eat steak, you eat steak. You don't eat it, you don't eat it. I used to think that was a bad thing. I'm like, oh my God, be like a girl. Stop being like your dad. But I had to not look at it from that perspective. Because it's really her picking up the good that's in him. And wanting to mimic that. So when a father leaves the home, it leaves the mother with the responsibility of doing the best job that she knows how. But just really hitting on men again, a mother cannot raise a son to be a man. She can do the best job she can do, but I'm not a man. Never have been, never will be. However, I can only try to direct. I can only try to build that foundation for you. But I can't mold you to be that man. So sometimes we, we take credit away from the men that have walked out on us. But they've walked out on you. They've walked out on their children. Because they didn't know what else to do. It wasn't in them. So they didn't get it either. Amen. When a father abandons his parental duties, he takes with him the grounded roots, your inheritance, and like I said, that piece of your identity. Wow. When he abandons his household, it sets the course for a journey of worldly, worldly discoveries that opens the door to do wrong, the door to wrong relationships, mm -hmm. yes. rebellion, yes. Right. and this is not just for men, this is for women too, yes. rebellion, um, Discovery of things that lead to a whole world of sin. It can also be an adverse reaction in the household when a dad is present. 
So it's not just when a dad is gone, because a dad can be there and not be there. But just to you dads who are in your children's life, it is important that you rediscover your identity in being a dad, the dad that God called you to be. I know I pray all the time for my husband, Lord, help him be the man that you have called him to be, whether that be a dad, whether that be an apostle, whether that be a husband, but to be what you have called him to be and steal in him those traits and those qualities that you want for his children to get out of him. And not just his natural children, his spiritual children as well. You all have to be, he has to be an example to all of you. So what you see in him, is what's going to come out of him. If you don't see God in him, you're not going to get God out of him. Amen? <clears throat> you believe that the hurt and pain you've experienced from life-altering offenses are part of who you are. So again, when that dad leaves, or even a mom leaves, you lose sight of who you are. You thrive on how the world identifies you, which is based on your profession, your associations, your accomplishments, or your conditions. And how do you thrive on that? This is just who I am. This is who the Lord made me to be. No, he didn't. This is what life made you to be. The Lord made you to be so much more. So when you're sitting back saying, I don't want to work. <laughs> Thinking that money just going to fall on your table and all your problems are going to be solved. No, not going to. There's so much more that God wants to get out of you, but we are afraid to come to God because we know the requirements are more. Yes. You believe that you will be no more than the labels or stereotypes that befell you either growing up or now. You hear things like, oh, you're not going to amount to anything. You're a teenage mom. You're a high school dropout. You mean nothing but a troublemaker. You're lifeless. You're good for nothing. And so many other labels that the world and people around us have given us. But you are not that. I promise you, you are not that. I was a teenage mom. But that didn't make me a statistic. I didn't let it. And not every teenage mom grows to the point of being a product of her environment. She doesn't. If you have God in you, you want more for you. You want more for your children. You live in fear, like I said, of making better choices for your life. I could go on and on as far as like as far as examples of your identity being stolen, but I'll stop there. Um, just because I know that your identity your identity really needs to be restored. And it hurts my heart for a lot of people that I encounter, because I'm like, Lord, why are they so broken? Lord, why are they so lost? And when I have those questions that resonate in my head, and I found myself telling my son this yesterday, it's when people see the God in you that they want to show you what's in them. So, for example, me and my husband, and I think we've told, told this story before, but there are so many times when we are like out or on an elevator or whatever, and people will just, all I have to do is say, hey, how you doing? And they will open up. Like, I'm not doing so good. You know, I got this going on, got that going on. And my son asked me, why do people do that, mom? Because it happens to him sometimes. And I'm like, Jeremy, it's because they see the God in you. It's because they see what God has put in you that he wants to get to them. So when we turn our back on people who, like I said earlier, who need us, we turn our backs on them. 
you never know what you could be you you could have stopped in them. You could have stopped somebody from suicide. You could have stopped somebody from going out and killing somebody else. All they wanted was an ear. Hear me. Talk to me. Give me whatever it is that's in you. Because most times their question is, oh my God, why are you so peaceful? Oh my God, why are you so loving? Oh my God, why do you still treat me like that? And I was a butthole. Amen. But I still love you anyway. Why? Because that's one of the characteristics of God. Good. So this brings me to your identity being your birthright. It is your birthright. And like I said, it's who you are, who you were born to be. <clears throat> but the things of this God forsaken world, y'all, can't get a hold of you and make you think that what you are or who you are is who you're supposed to be. But when you choose a life of sin, anything that goes against the will of God for a righteous living, you dishonor him. Not only do you dishonor him, you dishonor his son and his spirit living on the inside of you. Because God knows you can and have the potential to do right. But we choose not to. Yes. Your true identity can be stolen or taken, taken away from you by the trials and circumstances of your life. As a result of your disappointments, letdowns, and hurts, abandonment, or rebellious choices, you are led to make even more rebellious choices. We deal with so many rebellious people. And what does rebellion look like? I tell you, oh, the Lord said, and you say, hmm. I'm going to go do it what I want anyway. Yes. Rebellious means that I tell you, don't jump, and you jump anyway. <laughs> Rebellious means that, hey, this is what Christ is saying to you today. This is what the Lord is prophesying to you today. You listen, but you don't hear. Yes. And you still make your own choices. The receipt of this is in number in a number of passages in the Bible. But I want to talk about Reuben, for example. We know who Reuben was. He was the son of Joseph. Um, we know a brother of Joseph, son of Israel. Um, First Chronicles 5 1 says that. The oldest son of Israel was Reuben, but since he dishonored dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubines, his, birth, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. So that's an example of his birthright, his, pretty much his identity being taken away from him. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical records as the firstborn son. So it didn't matter that he was Israel's firstborn. None of that mattered. But because he chose to live his own way, it was taken away. Wow. The descendants of Judah became the most powerful tribe and provided a ruler for the nation. But the birthright, mm -hmm. I get this, the birthright belonged to Joseph. Wow. wow. We know the story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. Reuben, being the older brother, tried to stop them from killing his brother. And he, he was successful, but he didn't know that. He didn't know that he was successful in it. When he came back um, to get, after he had talked to them to put Joseph in a hole rather than kill him, he came back and all he saw was blood on his cloak. So he didn't know if they killed him or not. But they didn't. They had gotten rid of him, and we all know that story. But he probably, I can imagine him holding on to that for so long, which threw him in a life of, like, nah, I'm just going to do what I can do. I couldn't save my brother. So, you know, it probably changed the dynamic of his life. So despite his attempt to do the right thing, I mean, he was guilty pretty much. 
And by dishonoring his father, he dishonored the name, mm -hmm. his father's name. When we dishonor the Lord and who the Lord has wired us to be, has molded us to be, we dishonor his name. Reuben dishonored his name. It's got to be something, y'all, that just in him dishonoring his name, now he had no identity. You were my firstborn, but now you're in the Bible as not my first. Now, now you're not even listed wow. as my firstborn. Yeah. Wow. What if the consequences for dishonoring God was to strip us of our identity? Wow. What if God said, as a result of you doing what you've done, being who you choose to be, wow. I'm just going to take you off my records. Wow. You no longer exist wow. in my eyes. That's some harsh punishment. That made me think like, Lord, okay, show me my identity in you. You know, help me to stay down that road. And I get it. Sometimes we can wander off the road, you know, when times get a little tough for us or we don't want to push, we don't want to fight, we don't want to do anything. We can wander off the road. But, but... God can get us back on that road. He has no desire to eject us. No desire. He wants us to stay on the path. But we continue to dishonor him. We continue to dishonor the purpose that God has for us. And there's a scripture that I love that even gives us warning in Proverbs. There will come a day where you will eat the bitter fruit for living your own way. Reuben ate some bitter fruit, y'all. Yes. Another example that I want to get is the story or give is the story of Esau and Jacob. Mm -hmm. That's another example of your birth, losing your birthright, losing your identity. His birthright, but, you know, his birthright was not taken from him. It was stolen from him. Actually, it wasn't. It was given away. He gave it away. He gave away his birth night, his birthright um, by way of manipulation to feed his flesh. I won't read the scripture, but it's in Genesis 25, 27 through 33. Um, and it talks about Esau and Jacob. And we know Jacob was favored by his mother. Esau was favored by his father. But through his brother's manipulation and his mother's manipulation, because she played a big part in that too, he wagered his birthright because of his hungry flesh. Now, was he really dying of starvation like he told his brother? No, he was not. At the time, he was just hungry. But he had no idea what he was doing. He had no idea that he, even he was giving away his identity to his brother. And he didn't know the short or long-term consequences of that. He allowed himself to be manipulated right out of his birthright. Mm -hmm. In the natural, what that looks like is that we try to steal or mimic the identity of those around us. Without getting to know who we are. I want to be like her when I grow up. Hmm. I want to be like him when I grow up. Mm -hmm. I want to make as much money as they make, but I don't want to have to work to do it. Mm. I want to drive the kind of car that they're driving. I don't want to save money to get it. I want to own a house like they own, but I don't want to build it. I don't want to clean up my credit. I don't want to do any of that. I want to live how I want to live, spend what I want to spend, do what I want to do, but I want everything. Wow. It's in the house. 
plus sacrifice. everything. Right, no sacrifice. You're not willing to make any sacrifices to discover, again, who you are and what God wants for you. Right, right. That's right. God may want you to just live the simple life because he knows how that's going to affect you down the road if yep. you try to go for all these different things. He knows that you're just going to jack the house up, <laughs> lose it, <laughs> Jack your credit up. Mm -hmm. He knows all of this. So he wants to take us step by step by step. This is your process. Mm -hmm. This is what I want for you. This is where I need for you to go. Right. This is the path that I need for you to take. That's right. Some of us, God has called to, for example, entrepreneurship. Some of us, God has called to work right. a job because I need to use you on that job. Yes. I've said before that I've been on my job for quite a number of years, 25 to be exact. <laughs> and in that time, I have not maintained the same space, the same place, the same position. I have not. But each area that I went to, God had a purpose. He had to use me in some fashion for someone in every area that I've chosen to go to. Right. When he doesn't want me to move, I apply for things and he puts a stop to it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, here recently, there was a couple of opportunities that were presented to me on my job. Um, I'm so glad that God has worked in me and is continuing to work through me because if I didn't know who I was in him, I could have been a Debbie Downer. But I know who I am in Christ. Yes. And so when the opportunity presented itself, I had to talk with my husband about it. And there was two positions that were um, presented to me. One would have taken me two grade levels above where I am. One would have taken me one. Um, the two grade levels above was director level positions which would have probably put me like in a really, really good place. I'm in a great place now as far as salary, but it would have put me in an even greater place, would have given me more money. But as I discovered a few years ago, we talked about it. What means more to me is my quality of life. Yes. Not the quantity, not the amount of money that we have, the amount of money that we are able to do these different things with. It's my quality. It's being able to spend time with my family and not worry about working 12, 13, 14 hours a day, every single day, having my computer sitting right there in front of me and I'm never turned off. I got to be turned on all the time. No, I value my quality of life. But I applied for the position. We were like, ah, go for it. What do you got to lose? I have nothing to lose but everything to gain if the Lord says it is not for you. Yes. Everything to gain. Yes. So I applied for it and, you know, got the no, the thanks but no thanks back. But it wasn't because I wasn't qualified. I was qualified. I'm qualified to do the job. It was because the Lord said no. Because I need for you to continue to support your husband. In ministry yes. I can't have you adding more things on your plate because I need for you to do these things over here and you're in a good place yes. you're in a good place and in that place I give you great increase yes. annually yes. and every single time you get a merit increase I give you a five thousand plus dollar bonus and this is not to put our business out there, but just showing you what God chooses to do, he will do. What God said he's going to do, he will do. So I don't need to promote you. You still get the money. Yes. I don't need for you to jump out of the fire into the frying pan. Right. But when you choose to, you're going to burn. You're going to burn a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
But in that, I need for you to say, I need for you to come back to me and say, Lord, forgive me. This yes. was my doing. I yes. did this. Yes. You didn't. Yes. So if I had taken, a, if I had gotten a position, taken it like I did before one time and cried through a hissy fit, told my husband, it's your fault that I'm still working here. I gotta quit. <laughs> Oh my God, y'all, that was like the most <laughs> devastating day of my life. He looked at me in my office and said, help her Lord, and walked away and said, we'll talk when you're done having your hissy fit. It was horrible, y'all, but it wasn't his fault. It was my fault because I chose something. I chose something that I knew the Lord didn't have for me. Right. And that was the one time I moved based on money. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. This is, this is a pretty good increase. Let me take it. And we didn't need the money, y'all. This is a time where we didn't need the money. Our business was doing very well. Mm -hmm. And I took it anyway. <laughs> and boy, did I get some punches for doing that. Wow. But it wasn't where God wanted me to go. And it wasn't who he had established me to be. At that time. So I'm going to go really quickly through um, discovering who we are mm -hmm. and how to reclaim your identity. Yes. It's a wonderful thing when you discover who you are. Yes, it is. And my husband said it in his last message. Don't think for a minute that it's easy for me to be a first lady and a wife of an apostle who goes through deliverance, who is a father of many. It's not an easy thing. But with the Lord, it's not hard. With the Lord, I'm able to do many things. That I never thought I could do. Yes. Amen. And one of the most important is being able to stand before you. To be able to be an example to you. Amen. To be able to allow him to mold me and to model me. That's big. Yes, it is. I love how the Lord uses Pastor Patricia in so many of your lives. I love it because he has molded and modeled her. Now, for some of y'all, it means no because you don't want to listen anyway. <laughs> you take notes, it goes in one ear and right out the other. But first and foremost, who you are in the Lord is a living and breathing soul. He gave you life. Yes. Genesis 2, 7 said, Then the Lord formed the man from dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Yes. Then he said, Let me take this man and let me carve from him a rib and make a woman, and then I got to breathe life into her. Yes. So we are living souls. We are God's valuable possessions. We are his children. We were born in his exact likeness. As I said earlier, to have an identity means that you have to be born in something exact. God knew exactly what he wanted to make you. Ever wonder why we don't all look alike? There's a reason why we don't all look alike. If we all looked alike and we all had the same identity, how in the world could you tell us apart? Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. Not, in our, not that you are supposed to look like me, but in my image. I will make you. To be like us. Who is us? There had to be more than just God. Yes. 
So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over it. The fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. The, the part of the scripture that really stands out for me is when God said, then is when it says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't just mean children. Okay, now as I create these children, I want them to be fruitful and multiply. But we always sit back and wait for God to move. I already told you what I wanted you to do. Yes. But I'm going to wait for you, Lord, and see what else you says, what else you say do. God already said, all right, I want you to go for this particular position, and you're going to get promoted, and you're going to do this. But God, are you sure? Uh -huh. <laughs> all right, okay, hey, I want you to apply for this position because I think you're a wonderful worker, you know, and... and I have a say in whether or not you get it. Let me pray about it. Okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying about what God, when something comes to you, especially if you believe it is not of God. Yes. Pray about it. Make sure that you are being Holy Spirit led. Make sure God is leading you in the right direction. Make sure it is him. However, you can't get affirmation after affirmation after affirmation after affirmation. And I say that a million more times and still turn around and say, I got to pray about it. God, is that really you? And when you get to the point to the point of it being just complete silence and you don't hear nothing back. Right. Yeah, it was God, but he's saying, I'm not answering your foolish self now because you heard me the first million times, I said. But that's how we do, God. We continue to ask him and ask him and ask him. He's already given us so many answers, and it's the same answer all the time. It doesn't even change. He just got to reword it a little bit. Okay, maybe they didn't understand how I put it the first time. Right. Let me reword it and say it in a little bit of a different way. Your identity was already established from the moment of conception when you were just a hope and a prayer. Wow. When you were conceived, for some of us, hopefully most of us, it was a hope and a prayer that our parents have. I pray that I have a girl. I pray that I have a boy. I pray that I have a healthy baby. But for those of you that are going on to have children, stop praying for sex of your child. Because that child is going to feel the disappointment if there's something else. Just pray for a healthy baby. If God has blessed you with being able to have a baby. There are so many people that I know that have never been able to have a child. But yet we take it for granted having had them. Not Thanking God for just the ability. Because there are so many that are not able to. I have a really good friend who tried for years and years and years to have a child. And would have been the best mom I knew. But she never had a child. But I say that to say, you know, just be careful what you're praying for. But with her, she got some other issues going on too. Um, but it was her and her husband that, you know, wanted to have this child. She wanted nothing more but to have a child with her husband, but it didn't happen. Um, Jeremiah 1, 5, I knew about you before I formed you in your mother's room. Before you were born, I set you apart and anointed and appointed you as my prophet 
to the nations. So you have an identity before you're even born. God knows who he wants you to be, who he has established you to be. God was already present in you from the moment he formed you and breathed life into you. Psalm 139, I've learned that whole scripture, that whole Psalm 139 when I first started reading my Bible, because it just let me know, wow, God, you know everything about me, everything. Right. When I first came to Christ, I'm like, no way, no way. But then it got me to thinking like, wow, you formed every single bone in my body. You know every single thing that I'm going to do before I do it. You know every word that's going to come out of my mouth before I even say it. Wow. Right. That's amazing for somebody to know you in that way. Mm-hmm. But 15 through 16, he says, you formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Yes, Lord. Utter seclusion. So per- For me, even having children before I was the age of 18, um, I thought I was doing things in secret. Where my mom didn't know, got pregnant, tried to hide it from her. But God even saw that. Mm -hmm. But he saw fit to give me an opportunity despite all my mistakes that came along with having two children before the age of 18. He saw fit to clean me up. He saw fit to say, it doesn't matter, my child, what you did back then. You're a new creation now that you've come to me, now that you've found me. You're a new creation. And because you're a new creation, I'm going to make them a new creation. I'm going to reveal to them The same thing that I revealed to you about your mom. When God revealed to me your mom is the way she is because of everything that she went through, she knew no better. She had major responsibility in her life. The reason that she did the things that she did wasn't because of something she did wrong. It was because of things that she tried to do right. But the world got hold of her. I'm going to reveal to your children that you did the best job that you could do as a single mom. And in that, in that, and it just brings tears to my eyes, even in my prayer, in that, I will, I have broken your relationship with your son and your daughter, but I have restored that relationship. I restored the relationship with you and your son. Why? Because you let him go. Come yes. on. That's good. Why have I restored the relationship with you and your daughter? Because you let her go. Yes. You stopped trying to change her life. Yes. You stopped trying to change his life. You stopped trying to make him love you. You stopped trying to make her love you. And you gave them to me and said, Lord... I can't anymore. I won't anymore. You have your way with them. You chase them, Lord, because I can't. Nor should I be chasing them. I didn't grow up with a dad. And I grew up with a mom who was young, who wanted the streets, who made her choices in life. But today, I have recognized that The reason I couldn't value the relationship that my husband had with his daughters is because I didn't have that relationship as a daughter. But God put me in the right frame of mind. He had to remind me that when you met him, one of the things that you loved about him was his heart and how he was as a dad. And I got caught up with the world wishing that my children had the same thing, but it was too late Mm -hmm. for them to have that with their own dad. 
Now, did he come and try to be a dad to my kids? Yes, he did, but they were too far gone. And they were older. But now, they value who he is as a man of God. When things go wrong with them, they don't call me, they call him. And I love the example that he's trying to be in the lives of so many people. And I can't take that away from Prophet either. He may not, he may have been in the house with his children and may have made some mistakes with them. But today he is atoned for those mistakes. And now he gets to be a dad who is an example of what you get to be as an adult. Amen? Amen. So your true identity does not come from anyone in this world, any relationship that you are in, whether it is a marriage, whether it is a friendship, whether it is a working relationship, whatever it is, from any actions that you are performing or from any titles that you hold. Marriages, your identity is not in your spouse. Come on. Amen. You are an individual. What God wants from you, he wants from you. What he wants from him, he wants from him. And then he will bring that thing together and make you one for the purpose that he has you together for. God already identified you as a child and sent his spirit and his son to dwell in your heart. Although bad things happened to you, they were never meant to be a representation of who you were to become. Yes. God defined you, his child, by his word, which he declared over you and about you, which is your true, your true representation of your identity. I'll give this example really quick. Um, there's a number of confirmed stories in the Bible for, of those who are lost, stolen, broken, and so on. But they found their identity in Christ. They rediscovered who they were. One of the examples that I love is the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, whose daily ritual was to just go sit, beg, you know, by the gates. But then he heard Jesus was coming. The disciples told him no, they rebuked him, didn't want him, you know, anywhere near Jesus, but he kept shouting. Even though his condition, even in his condition, he kept shouting. And although he was a blind man, he had insight into knowing that his identity was stolen. He knew there was a reason he couldn't see. But he also knew that his identity would be restored. to vision, restored to vision and purpose through Christ. Though he couldn't see, he could see. He knew that Christ was coming. He heard, he saw with his ears, Christ is coming and I need to get to him. And his vision was restored. He could now see. But he knew that would not happen had he not gotten near Christ. Another sample is Simon Peter. Simon Peter, who was one of Jesus' disciples, he denied Christ. And his identity in Christ because he feared people. Don't fear people. Be who God called you to be in front of people. Even though Peter made mistakes, God made concessions for him. And he'll make the same concessions for you. And it was nothing more than get Peter back on track. We have all made mistakes and have denied Christ at some point in our life because of fear, because we fear people. 
And your denial of him is not saying I don't know him. Your denial of him is not talking about him. So if you're in conversation with someone and they bring up Jesus, they bring up whatever their issue is, don't try to solve it with the natural because you're scared to talk to them about the Lord. Talk to them about the Lord. Yes. Again, give them your testimony. Tell them what the Lord did for you. I'm going to go through these real quickly. Um, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to read through them fairly quickly. And it's how to reclaim your identity. One, you have to believe in the fact that no matter what you have been through, you are a child of the Most High God. He doesn't disqualify you. You disqualify you. And you have to allow him to redeem his role as God the Father in your life. You have to know that you are no longer a slave to sin. And that your identity is not a part of your past. You have to overcome by the mere words of your testimony. Your testimony that I've been talking about. When people don't know God's call on your life today, they dwell on who you used to be yesterday. Believe that your identity gives you access to who you truly are, whose you are, and the name that you carry, and the gifts and talents that he has given you that makes you valuable. Be devoted to fulfill the work God has given you to do with excellence. Not perfection, excellence. Because God is the only perfect thing. You have to take responsibility for your own conscience and mind that God gave you. Don't let social media continue to define you by comparing yourself to others. Wow. Competing for likes, being jealous of the looks or advantages of others you think others have that caused your insecurities. The way that you think about other people, is it causes insecurities in you. If you see that something's good on someone else, then you start comparing yourself to that person, then you lose who you are. Don't let the way other people are or how they look define you. Take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to others, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. Reside in the truth that your affirmation and validation does not define you, but your identity in Christ does. So stop seeking affirmation from others to give you accolades on a job well done. Or a nice car, nice work, nice shoes. Looking for them to make you valid or co-signing and co-signing your destiny. You have to stop looking for them to affirm you. They don't need to co-sign who you are supposed to be. God has already signed for it. People could care less about who you are. Where you've been, what you've done, how much money you've had, where you're going, or where you desire to go, and what truly matters to you. They don't care. You have to care about who you are, where you're going, where you desire to be. Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul speaks and he says, I'm obviously not trying to flatter you or water down my message to be popular with men. But by my supreme passion, but my supreme passion is to please God. For if all I attempt to do is please people, I would, I would fail to be a true servant of Christ. Even the Apostle Paul had to reestablish his identity because Apostle Paul wasn't always a Christian follower. He wasn't always a Christ follower. He was Jewish. And he made the lives of Christians a living H-E double hockey sticks, I'll say that. But he did not support them 
But then he had to reestablish his identity through Christ. And it was during his rebirth when Christ was unveiled to him. You have to let go of your dependency on an obsession with your worldly possessions, your likes, your posts, your mentions, all that stuff on social media. You got to let it go. They are only a representation of your of purchases made, income generated, whether you saved it or borrowed it, and recognitions toward who you think you are and what you truly represent. Most of our savings accounts, so sad to say, are not by the money we earned. It's by the money we borrowed and put there. Yet you still paying a loan off. So how can you ever save money? How can you ever save your hard-earned money if you're borrowing money and padding your bank account with it? Your identity is not in an object or appearance. Stuff depreciates over time, and you lose appreciation for it. Don't harp on your mistakes. We all make them. You have to seek to discover your identity beyond the mistake. No longer believe the lies that you are worthless, nothing, useless, damaged, or a victim. You are no longer a victim. You have to remember that your identity is not in the crisis. It's in the Christ. Seeking your identity in the wrong way, in the wrong people, and the wrong things come with a price. Are you willing to pay the price to have someone else's identity? Or will you seek the identity of the one who gave you yours? The one who has already paid the ultimate price. Amen. Praise God. I hope you guys got something out of that.